Welcome everyone to our opening keynote of our Fall Friends for Life conference. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes and let all of our attendees join. Again, welcome to the opening session for our Friends for Life Fall 2021 virtual conference. I'm gonna wait another couple of seconds to let our attendees join in uh, from the, uh, the waiting area. All right, I think we've got everybody here. Again, welcome to Friends for Life Fall 2021, our virtual conference. We'd certainly hope to be doing this in person, but the world wasn't quite ready to do that. Uh, my name is Jeff Hitchcock. I am the founder and president of Children with Diabetes. We are very, very happy that you could join us tonight. Uh, you can use the chat and Q&A Q &A, uh, features during the session if you have any questions. Our presentation this evening is recorded though. So Arthur was unable to join us this evening, but he recorded his presentation. We will do our best to answer any questions that you might have. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors for this wonderful uh, week that we have planned for you. Lilly Diabetes, Novo Nordis, Dexcom as our founding sponsors, uh, uh, Insulet and Tandem Diabetes as our supporting sponsors, and Beta Bionics and Prevention Bio as our friends of CWD. These companies make it possible for us to bring this to you. Uh, and this evening's uh, presentation, our opening keynote, is sponsored by Lilly Diabetes, and they will be providing uh, the actual introduction. So I'm going to mute and uh, turn off my video and begin the presentation. Hello, my name is Ruth Jimeno. I head diabetes research for Eli Lilly and Company. Welcome to the Friends for Life Fall Conference, a week of virtual celebration. We are thrilled to be here with all of you, this dedicated diabetes community, for a week of learning, virtual connections and inspiration. Lilly is privileged to have a long-standing history of support for children with diabetes and the Friends for Life Conference. We recognize that education and peer support have a powerful impact on families attending these conferences. Diabetes innovation has been at the forefront of our business since the discovery of insulin in 1921. In January of 1922, 14-year-old Leonard Thompson became the first person with diabetes to be treated with insulin, the world's first life-saving treatment for diabetes. This year, as we celebrate 100 years of insulin, we are proud to launch the inaugural Leonard Award, which not only commemorates the centennial milestone, but also recognizes diverse champions dedicated to advancing diabetes management. We are excited to announce the first recipients of the award later this week. I'm honored to stand in front of our mother and son sculpture here at Lilly's headquarter in Indianapolis. Inspired by a photo many of you have likely seen, the photo of a mother holding her son, JL, who had diabetes and was one of the first to be treated with insulin. It symbolizes and it is a constant reminder of Lily's commitment to supporting families through every step of the diabetes journey. With that, I'm honored to introduce the keynote speaker for this year's fall conference, Arthur Ainsberg. Arthur is a writer, 
and a Wall Street executive. A veteran of the financial services industry, Arthur has served in senior management and consulting roles at Oppenheimer, Odyssey Partners and Morgan Stanley. Arthur has experienced his own medical challenges, having been diagnosed in 1975 at the age of 28 with Hodgkin's disease. At the time of his diagnosis, doctors had only recently developed a method of treatment that could cure the disease. His interest in medicine, born from personal experience, combined with his love of history, set him on the path to writing this book, Breakthrough, Elizabeth Hughes, The Discovery of Insulin, and The Making of a Medical Miracle, which St. Martin's Press published in September 2010. A lifelong New Yorker, Arthur is an avid traveler who has visited all 50 states and 75 countries on seven continents. He has also visited every Major League Baseball stadium and most of the U.S. presidential libraries. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Arthur here with us today. Thank you all for joining me this afternoon, and thank you all for that very kind int introduction. When I first learned the story behind the discovery of insulin, I knew that this was a story that had to be told. For me, Breakthrough has been a seven year labor of love. And I am so happy to be sharing this thrilling and moving tale with you. Our story is about extraordinary people, forgotten by history, who gave insulin to the world, framed around the experience of a young girl named Elizabeth Hughes, one of insulin's first recipients. It is a story of intense scientific rivalries, bitter fights, and multiple setbacks, which fortunately resulted in insulin being purified and made available to diabetics everywhere. The discovery of insulin by Frederick Banting, Charles Best, J.J.R. McLeod, and Bertram Collip really is one of the greatest medical advances in recent history. The development and worldwide distribution of insulin took about two years. Today, a new drug takes 10 to 15 years to get through development and regulatory review. The cost associated with developing a drug has also increased dramatically. A new drug today often exceeds $2 billion, while insulin costs only $1,400 to develop and $250,000 to reach the world. <clears throat> For me, this story is quite personal. In 1975, when I was 28 years old, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. Until the early 1960s, Hodgkin's had been a death sentence. I was fortunate enough to be diagnosed at a time when a treatment was available, and I was cured. Because of my own experience, I felt a deep connection to this story, to Elizabeth Hughes as the one who faced a dire diagnosis, to her family who stayed by her side, and to the researchers whose tireless effort completely changed the odds of survival. The discovery of insulin occurred 100 years ago, yet this medical miracle is just as important today as it was on the day it was discovered. In fact, there are about 450 million people worldwide with diabetes today. Our story begins in 1919. The youngest daughter of the most famous politician in America has just been diagnosed with what was then a death sentence, juvenile diabetes mellitus. And according to the mortality tables, she would be dead in 11 months. Elizabeth's story, the story of the man who kept her alive and of the four discoverers is one of hope, courage, determination, and miracles. In order, in order to better understand the magnitude of this amazing discovery, 
And it's important to know a little bit more about diabetes and its history. When you have diabetes, your body either doesn't make enough insulin or can't use the insulin it does produce as well as it should. <clears throat> the pancreas, an organ near the stomach, produces the hormone insulin, which helps glucose get into the body cells to be used as energy. If your body is not producing insulin, then you cannot metabolize glucose. And if you're unable to metabolize glucose, you can't live. <clears throat> Diabetes is a century old disease recorded as far back as 1550 BC by the ancient Egyptians. Their preferred method of treating the disease included eating a boiled assortment of bones, wheat, grain, and earth. While this may seem absurd, it's actually not that far off from the treatments of the early 20th century. For thousands of years, little more was learned. Then in the 18th century, scientists discovered that the sweet, sticky substance found in the urine was sugar. In the 19th century, scientists isolated the islets of Langerhans, a cluster of cells in the pancreas that secretes a hormone, which lowers glucose levels in the blood. The mysterious pancreatic secretion was named insulin. Yet, despite this knowledge, in 1918, physicians were still helpless to prevent the death of those diagnosed. And while waiting for a miracle cure, doctors turned to a radical starvation treatment to prolong the lives of their patients. <clears throat> the radical treatment was developed by Frederick Allen, one of the leading endocrinologists at the time, also known as Dr. Diabetes. After graduating from the University of California Medical School, Allen decided to pursue a career in medical research. He obtained a fellowship at Harvard at $42.50 a month. It was at Harvard that he developed an interest in diabetes. His work at Harvard culminated in a groundbreaking book entitled Studies Concerning Glycosuria and Diabetes. This book caught the attention of the folks at Rockefeller Institute in New York City, including the world famous medical director, Dr. Simon Flexner. Given his own lab at Rockefeller, Allen continued his work at Rockefeller for five years from 1913 to 1918. And it was during this period that diabetics around the world carried their little Bible, a little red book, the name of the book written by several doctors for the layman was called Starvation, parenthesis, Allen Treatment of Diabetics. The book was such an enormous bestseller in that era that 100 years later, after its publication, you can go on Amazon or other websites and still purchase copies of this original book. As stated in the preface to their book, as you can see on the screen, the starvation treatment of diabetes as advanced by Dr. Frederick Allen of the Rockefeller Institute Hospital is undoubtedly a most valuable treatment. Allen's drastic diet usually kept juvenile diabetics alive for months beyond their original prognosis, but as living skeletons. Elizabeth Hughes would become one of Allen's most successful patients. In 1918, <clears throat> Elizabeth was a healthy, adventurous girl with a promising future but within one year's time, everything would change. 
she would begin showing the classic symptoms of diabetes, insatiable thirst, ravenous hunger, and rapid weight loss. Elizabeth was a child of privilege. She was the youngest daughter of Charles Evans Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes, who to this day remains the only man in American history to have served as governor, secretary of state, associate justice, and later chief justice of the Supreme Court. Hughes was a lawyer's lawyer. And among his clients during this period that he was not in public service were John D. Rockefeller, both senior and junior, and their various corporate interests. In addition, Hughes served for a number of years on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. Elizabeth's parents, Charles and Antoinette, enlisted the help of Dr. Allen. Allen's notoriety was something of a mixed blessing, like being an experienced and excellent executioner. Imagine Allen having to go to the esteemed politician Charles Evans Hughes and his wife and tell them both, your daughter is going to die. Alan told them that he could prolong Elizabeth's life, but she would never eat normally again. Every single gram of food would be weighed and regulated. Her diet would consist of eggs, cream, bran rusks, and vegetables boiled three times in order to rid them of carbohydrates. At times, Elizabeth consumed as little as 400 calories a day. Allen's motto was to starve is to survive. This was the horrible decision that families were forced to make, choosing between the lesser of two evils for their children. Many medical experts at the time believed it more humane to allow their patients to eat themselves to death than to subject them to the torture of Allen's diet. Elizabeth's parents, however, followed Allen's advice and chose the most radical of treatments, keeping Elizabeth alive long enough to benefit from the breakthrough on the horizon. But at the time, Allen and the Hughes family could know that salvation lied ahead. With a mediocre graduate of the University of Toronto's medical school, and his name was Frederick Banting. I'd like to share a story about Banting that I think conveys the type of man that he was. During World War I, Banting joined the Canadian Army Medical Corps. And in the fall of 1918, his camp was under ferocious attack and a piece of shrapnel tore into his right arm. Banting was immediately ordered into the waiting ambulance, but as stretcher after stretcher of wounded soldiers arrived, Banting disobeyed his superior in order to stay and treat the men. He would stay there wounded for 17 hours, during which time his wound became so infected that his doctors threatened amputation. Banting's determination to save lives in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles would serve him well in the years to come. After the war, Banting returned to Canada. Having few job prospects, he opened his own medical practice. He went 28 straight days without seeing a single patient. His income for the first month of his private practice was $4. In desperate need of funds, Banting accepted a position as an instructor at the University of Western Ontario. Salary for the position, $2 an hour, but his struggles would lead to his greatest success. At one o'clock in the morning of October 31st, 
20, while tediously preparing for the following day's lecture, Banting read through the November issue of a medical journal called Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics. The article, written by an American pathologist named Moses Barron, was entitled The Relationship of the Eyelids of Langerhans to Diabetics, with special reference to causes of pancreatic lithiasis. Upon finishing the article, Banting fell into a troubled sleep, only to be abruptly awakened at 2 a.m. by the force of an idea. Taking a small black notebook, Banting scribbled 25 words that would eventually lead to the solution of a medical mystery that had persisted for thousands of years. Banting wrote the following, diabetes, ligate pancreatic ducts of dog, keep dogs alive till the senai degenerate leave eyelids. Try to isolate the internal secretion of these to relieve lacosuria. I like to think that Banting understood the importance of those scribbles because that note still exists today, housed in the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Ontario. Banting's idea was essentially this. By tying off part of the pancreas, he hoped to isolate the eyelids of Langerhans and the elusive secretion that they secrete. Little did he know, that this was not a new idea. Researchers before him had tried and failed. But even though Banting's idea wasn't an original one, his persistence led to a solution that was both original and successful. The next day, Banting approached a colleague and the colleague suggested that Banting discuss his idea with one of the greatest authorities on metabolism at the time, Dr. J.J.R. McLeod, chairman of the physiology department at the University of Ontario. As an aside, I should mention that one year earlier, a group of Canadian medical schools received a $5 million contribution from the Rockefeller Fund for expanding facilities and upgrading the quality of their facilities. And of that 5 million, the University of Toronto was a beneficiary of $1 million. This transformative gift to the Canadian medical schools almost 100 years ago now was recently the subject of a book, Rockefeller Foundation, Funding and Medical Education in Toronto, Montreal and Halifax. Now, these two men, Banting and McLeod, could not have been more different. McLeod was formal, reserved, distinguished looking. Banting, self-conscious and inarticulate. From McLeod's notes on their encounter, we know that Banting's proposal if you can call it that, was hardly well thought out. And in his frantic excitement, McLeod thought that Banting looked like he wandered in from the nearby psychiatric ward. But there was something about Banting that convinced McLeod to give him a chance. McLeod chose two student research associates, Charles Best and Clark Noble, to work alongside Banting. They decided, that is, Noble and Best decided to flip a coin to see who would go first. Charles Best won. Nothing about the research process would be easy for Banting and Best. And the summer of 1921 was a perfect example. It was one of the hottest summers on record. And in the oppressive heat, they began to 
testing Banting's theory by operating on the pancreases of dogs. The conditions of the lab they worked in were far from ideal. The operating table was made of wood. The linens were tattered. The floor couldn't be properly sterilized. And the stench of the lab was nearly intolerable. After seven weeks, Banting and Best had nothing to show for their work but carcasses. All their dogs had died, forcing them to prowl the streets of Toronto, capturing strays. But by the end of that summer, they had their first breakthrough. They depancreatized two dogs, dog 92 and dog 409. Dog 92 would be given their experimental extract islatin, while dog 409 would serve as their control. The results of the experiment were unmistakable. Dog 409 was barely able to walk, while dog 92 was prancing around the lab like a house pet. Two days later, dog 409 was dead, but dog 92 would live a remarkable 20 days without a pancreas. Upon her death, Banting turned his face away from Best and wept. Banting later wrote, I shall never forget the dog, that dog as long as I shall live. I have seen patients die and I have never shed a tear. But when that dog died, I wanted to be alone for the tears would fall despite anything that I could do. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Hughes spent the summer of 1921 trying to live as best as she could with a disease that was slowly killing her. She lived vicariously through adventure stories depicting things she hoped to do someday. And despite her condition, she planned for the future. In one letter to her mother, she wrote of her intent to ride in a hydro airplane along Lake, Char Lake George for her 21st birthday. But that 21st birthday was hardly guaranteed. In fact, it was unlikely. That August, her 14th birthday, was celebrated not with cake, but with a large hat box decorated to resemble a cake covered with pink paper and candles. Elizabeth was so weak that it took her 11 tries to blow out the candles. Back in Toronto, Banting made his first presentation to the scientific community on November 14, 1921. Following his lecture, researchers around the world would begin to hear of the enormous breakthrough that had occurred. McLeod was finally convinced that Banting and Best's research was worthy of a larger team. So he brought on Bertrand Collip, a brilliant professor of biochemistry, to assist in the development process. Collip was spending that year in Toronto on a Rockefeller scholarship but the dissension among the researchers would become so intense that to this day, there exists not a single photograph of the four man members of the discovery team in a single frame. They couldn't even stand together long enough to have their picture taken. On December 28th, 1921, Banting, Best, and McLeod told the world about their extraordinary discovery at the American Phil Physiological Society Conference held that year at Yale University. Word had spread about the work being done in Toronto, and Banting and Best and McLeod were the most anticipated presentation of the day. The audience that day was packed with diabetes experts, 
including Elliot Jocelyn, Frederick Allen, and Alec Clues, a researcher from Eli Lilly and Company. From reading Banting and McLeod's accounts of that day, we know that McLeod introduced Banting. He described the research in detail, but, but repeatedly used the word we, which to Banting made it seem like McLeod was trying to take credit for a discovery that Banting felt McLeod had very little hand in creating. When Banting finally stood to speak, his face was red with rage. His voice was so quiet that those in the audience struggled to hear him. But he did manage to convey that at that very moment that they were gathered at Yale University, there was a diabetic dog named Marjorie in Toronto who had lived without a pancreas for an unprecedented 42 days. Banting and Best had kept Marjorie alive using an extract made from fetal calf pancreases. After the speeches, Banting and McLeod were approached by Alec Clues, a man who instead of spending the holidays with his family in Indianapolis, had left home on Christmas morning just to be in attendance that afternoon. Clues proposed a collaboration between Eli Lilly and the University of Toronto. He believed that if Banting's discovery stayed in a purely academic setting, too much time would be spent at conferences rather than saving diabetics. Eli Lilly believed the future of pharmaceutical manufacturing lay in identifying those research projects with commercial potential. J.K. Lilly Sr. and his son Eli were prepared to bet the ranch to develop insulin. The Lilly philosophy was ideas don't cure people, drugs cure people. However, Banting and McLeod rejected Eli's assistance that day, but clues would not be deterred. Recognizing the importance of the work, he immediately wired a three-word telegram to the Lilly family. This is it. But what would become the first collaboration between a pharmaceutical company and a university wouldn't occur until months later. Back in Toronto, the relationship among the researchers continued to unravel. <coughs> Banting, Banting felt that the team was pushing him out of the next phase of development. The responsibility for purifying the substance was given to Bertram Collop as the best chemist. And more doctors were brought on to oversee the clinical trials. <coughs> Amid this drama, a 65 pound 14 year old boy in the final stages of diabetes was admitted to Toronto General Hospital. On January 11th, 1922, Leonard Thompson became the first person ever to be injected with insulin, but Banting would not be the one to administer it. Not long after Leonard's injection, insulin became, supply <coughs> became too low to continue with human trials. And after struggling for months to purify and develop a method for securing adequate supply, the Toronto team had failed. So Banting and McLeod finally accepted <coughs> Eli Lilly's offer to help. They entered into a one-year licensing agreement allowing Eli Lilly and company to develop the process for the mass production of a usable extract. Lilly, 
immediately went to work convincing nearby slaughterhouses to supply the 2,000 pounds of pancreas glands needed each week in order to begin production. They told the meat packers that every pound shipped could potentially save a child's life. And soon the precious ingredients were arriving by the train load. Throughout the summer of 1922, the insulin plant at Lilly would run three ships a day with over 100 engineers, scientists, and doctors focused solely on finding a method of mass producing insulin. The lights never went out in the science building, and still they could not meet the demand. Physicians everywhere were desperate for what was being touted as a miracle drug. And in order to motivate the scientists, the doctors began coming to the Lilly labs with photographs of their emaciated patients. The work in Indianapolis proceeded at a feverish pace, but with a multitude of setbacks. And that July, with Toronto in desperate need of insulin, Banting made a frantic trip to Eli Lilly in Indianapolis to procure enough supply to keep his patients alive. Waiting for him at the train station was J.K. Lilly and 150 units of insulin. When he was told that he could take it all back with him, Banting was so overcome with emotion that he fell onto Lilly's shoulders and wept. After that, Lilly pledged to supply Toronto with 500 units a week. At the same time, news of the discovery was being trumpeted by the press. <clears throat> Banting was put in the difficult position of deciding who would receive insulin and who would not. He wrote of the almost mythical perception of the drug, and he said, Diabetics swarm around from all over and think that we could conjure the extract from the ground. Banting was forced to turn away hundreds who arrived at his clinic and hundreds more who wrote him. One of those letters was from Elizabeth Hughes's mother, Antoinette Hughes. Antoinette wrote that Elizabeth's condition had worsened and that she was exceedingly weak and wasted. Antoinette was desperate for any kind of help, even if it only meant a brief reprieve so Elizabeth could gain a few pounds. But there simply wasn't enough insulin. And even Elizabeth, daughter of the United States Secretary of State, was denied. However, Antoinette refused to give up hope and wrote Banting another letter. At this point in our research, we began to realize that Charles Evans Hughes must have intervened on his daughter's behalf because less than a month later, Elizabeth would be granted a spot in Toronto. But her spot would be at the sake of another child. Elizabeth recognized that the privilege afforded to her as the daughter of a famous politician allowed her to receive this miracle serum, while so many other children were denied. In fact, only three of Dr. Allen's original 100 patients would survive long enough to receive insulin. On August 15, 1922, a few days shy of her 15th birthday, Elizabeth Hughes arrived in Toronto to begin an experimental treatment that could end her 40 month struggle or it could end her life. We were moved at this moment in our research, trying to understand the magnitude of this meeting. Two people who never gave up hope in the face of impossible odds coming together for this momentous occasion.
in medical history. We can learn a lot about perseverance from Banting and Elizabeth. Elizabeth adhered perfectly to Allen's diet, never wavering in her belief that if she could stay alive long enough, a breakthrough would occur that could save her. Banting also acted out of pure conviction, leaving a newly established medical practice and his fiance all to pursue an idea that had come to him in the middle of the night. Because of that conviction, millions of lives would be saved and Elizabeth would attain her miracle. Having outlived her prognosis by more than two years, weighing only 48 pounds, Elizabeth sat in Banting's office, the hospital gown barely hiding her frail frame as she received her first injection. Elizabeth's improvement was immediate. She described the experience as unspeakably wonderful, and she would become Banting's most famous patient, a veritable poster child for diabetes. But Elizabeth chose to follow her moment of fame with a lifetime of silence. She married, had three children, took two insulin injections a day, and successfully hid her disease from everyone outside of her family. She destroyed most of the evidence, even pictures of herself taken in the ravages of the starvation diet, which as you can imagine, made her a particularly difficult protagonist to write about. The, on, the only tangible evidence we have of her life from 1919 to 1922 is a series of the most remarkable letters ever written by a child to her mother and father. In 1930, Elizabeth married William Gossett, a prominent New York attorney and a future president of the American Bar Association. She resumed a normal life, but chose to keep her illness a secret. Uh, she had, as I said, three children, took two insulin injections a day, and, and hid her disease. When she died in 1981, at the age of 73 years old, Elizabeth Hughes had received some 42,000 insulin injections more than any other human being at the time. The story of Elizabeth in 1922 was headline news around the world, but skeptics were still afraid to change from all sorts of homemade recipes and patent medicine remedies for diabetes to try an experimental serum developed by a bunch of folks in Toronto until a very special event occurred. On June 19th of 1923, John D. Rockefeller Jr. announced a gift of $150,000 for the distribution of insulin and training of doctors to provide insulin at 10 major universities and hospitals. Having the seal of approval, of Rockefeller and the Rockefeller Institute calmed the skeptics about this new substance called insulin. As for Banting, his prominence only grew. For the work with insulin, he was awarded the 1923 Nobel Prize in Medicine, along with J.J.R. McLeod. They shared, they shared their awards with the other key team members. Banting also developed a personal and long lasting relationship with the children whose lives he saved. Recognizing both the revolutionary aspect of the discovery in the world of science and the incredible impact 
it had on individual lives. Years later, he wrote one of his patients, I shall always follow your career with interest. And you will forgive me if I add a little pride, because I shall always remember the difficult times we had in the early days of insulin. Tragically, Banting died about 20 years after his life-saving discovery. During World War II, while serving as a liaison officer between the British and North American medical services, he was killed in an air disaster. But his, his legacy lives on in the millions of lives he saved. Looking back on the history can remind us how far we've come and of the importance of our continued efforts. And if there is one thing I want to convey to people to take away from this extraordinary story, it's that the work being done at any given moment could produce the next breakthrough. I have now spent many years immersed in the story. And in bringing the story of insulin to life, it was important for me to honor the lives lost the sacrifices of the research team, those who benefited and those who continue to struggle today. And even though the landscape of diabetes management has changed dramatically, the discovery of insulin remains just as essential today. Thank you all. And I wish you a good day and good health. Be well. Well, I hope you found Arthur's presentation as inspiring as I did as we near the 100th anniversary of those incredible days. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us. I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting us. Uh, please complete the survey that you will see uh, after tonight's session. And one last note, uh, this is the last week of our fall campaign, 100 Years of Us. We received a challenge. Uh, we need 100 donations of at least $25, and we will earn a $25,000 gift from one of our board members. And you can give now at cwd.is 100 challenge, 100 challenge. Ah, Marissa put it in the chat to make it easier. Uh, for those of you who are uh, have some more time tonight, we have two more presentations at 8 o'clock. One is uh, a time to spend with Tandem, learn about their product, and another is with Prevention Bio to learn about their work in preventing type 1 diabetes and at-risk individuals. So we will sign off here, give everyone about a 12-minute break, and we'll see you back uh, at one of those sessions in 12 minutes. Thank you again very much, and have a good evening. <laughs>